Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It happened on June 19, 1865, the day the Union Army General Gordon Granger announced General Order No. 3, proclaiming freedom from slavery in Texas. But the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect two and a half years earlier in January of 1863. So what took so long for the enslaved in Texas to finally get the news? Why are so many people unfamiliar with Juneteenth, the holiday celebrating the freedom of enslaved people? And why is the holiday so important during this time of racial reckoning in America? Up next on Another View, and Another View history lesson on Juneteenth, right after this news from NPR and WHRV News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Juneteenth. Some call it Emancipation Day. It's been called Jubilee, Jubilee Day, Liberation Day, and Freedom Day. It's June 19th. It commemorates the day that the enslaved in Texas finally got the news that slavery was outlawed in America. What took so long for the word to spread? What else was happening at the time? Joining us with an Another View history lesson on Juneteenth is historian and dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Hello, Cassandra. How are you? Hello, Barbara. And welcome back. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's wonderful to join you all. (laughs) And also joining us is Ms. Sherry Bailey, playwright, activist, community organizer, educator, and founder of the Juneteenth Festival Company. Hi, Sherry. How you doing? I'm well, Barbara. Thank you for having me here today. Oh, thank you so much for being with me. So, ladies, um, apparently the bill to make Juneteenth a federal holiday is on President Biden's desk. It's supposed to be signed this afternoon. How how timely could we be, Sherry? <laughs> <laughs> could not be more so, you know? It's amazing. It's been taking it's years and years and years of pushing for this. And then suddenly in like two hours, it happens. <laughs> so I, I wonder, for, especially from your perspective, because I have to tell you, growing up in Baltimore, um, we didn't talk about Juneteenth. And I learned about it from you um, and from when I came to the area and you were putting on festivals um, for celebrating Juneteenth when other people weren't. So what oh, does this mean for you? June, back in the June day. Who? Yes, June exactly. Who, June what? <laughs> And uh, I mean, and I, that was my uh, experience as well. I discovered it, and I was taking a walk when I lived in Los Angeles. I was taking a walk, and uh, all of a sudden we stumbled on this event, and it was like June what? And it was Juneteenth, and uh, so that's how I uh, discovered it, and uh, then realized uh, uh, once I came back home that so much of the history that uh, pertains to what Juneteenth is trying to share is our local history here in Hampton Roads, 757. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure this is a, a, a milestone day for you. Um, Cassandra, would the um, Senate passed it overwhelmingly, um, bipartisan support by both the Senate and the House, except that 14 members of the Republican Party did not vote to pass this as a national law um, in Congress. And I want to read a quote from um, one of the congressmen, um, a Representative Matt Rosendale of Montana, who says, uh, quote, let's call an ace an ace. This is an effort by the left to create a day out of whole cloth to celebrate identity politics as part of its larger efforts to make critical race theory the reigning ideology of our country. Since I believe in treating everyone equally, regardless of race, and that we should be focused on what unites us rather than our differences, I will vote no. Now, I wonder what you think. If he's talking about uniting us, shouldn't Juneteenth be yet another way to unite us as a country as opposed to separating us? You know, his statement contains so much to unpack, but suffice it to say that essentially he's 
still seeing black history as not American history. He's still seeing that the, the celebration of Juneteenth was about black agency. It was not about whether or not we are uh, engaging in identity politics. Uh, identity politics, I'm really not sure what that is supposed to be, other right. than the nation has created through its laws a system that actually designated identity politics very early on, back in the 17th century, when, for example, uh, a Virginia 1639 law declared that black people could not own a weapon, or in 1642, a law that said that black women were to be taxed just as a man would be taxed, mm. and that this would not apply to women. Um, and so when you're talking about identity politics, the Virginia law that said that only white men could be freeholders, that only white people could be citizens of this country. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So when we talk about identity politics, we have to actually say that the law created the identity that an American was a white person, mm. not a black person, not a person of color, not a person not from Europe. That's what our nation did. But to turn that back around and to say that because people of African descent want their history recognized, they want their advocacy recognized, they want how America treated them recognized in our larger landscape is not identity politics unless you simply want to go back to that old idea that the only Americans are white Americans. And I'm glad that this, this, that this congressperson wants uh, or, or sees everyone, he treats everyone equally, but that statement tells me he's not because he's refusing to recognize the history of African Americans. And by the way, the critical race theory, I'm really not sure what language people are speaking, but when they're talking about critical race theory, it has absolutely nothing to do with what it is. It has everything to do with a theory that was actually created by uh, Derek Bell, mm -hmm. um, who looked at the law because he was a law professor. And this is the, that critical race theory is taught in law schools so that law school professors are teaching their students that there's a whole line of laws that have separated people by race. And that this goes back to the origins of mm -hmm. this country and with people of color and to understand the impact that that has had on not only the treatment, but on the stress and strain of people to try to find equity before the law. Mm -hmm. And so when people are talking about critical race theory today and they're demonizing it, they're really not dealing with the reality of what it is. Of what it actually is. So let me bring up one other point that another um, representative, Thomas Massey from Kentucky, now he took umbrage with the holidays naming. Um, the, the bill is called the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. Um, and mm -hmm. so his quote is, uh, quote, I fully support creating a day to celebrate the abolition of slavery. However, naming this day National Independence Day will create confusion and push Americans to pick one of these two days as their Independence mm -hmm. Day based on their racial identity. And instead, he would prefer it to be called Emancipation Day. Um, Sherry, do you think that's a is there a danger in that, that, you know, black folks are going to celebrate Juneteenth and then everybody else is going to celebrate the Fourth of July? I mean, because in essence, that's what he's saying. Well, uh, it, it, and even if they do celebrate both days, I mean, what's the problem with that? You know, in fact, Miss Opal Lee, uh, the 94 year old uh, leader of this movement to see Juneteenth become a national holiday, she says that Juneteenth should be celebrated from June 19th through July 4th. So we take those two weeks and celebrate freedom from the June 19th to the 14th, mm -hmm. I mean, to the 4th of July, which that works as well as in terms of uh, the Juneteenth holiday. Actually, it was in Ju uh, June of 1866 in Oklahoma when the five Indian tribes were had signed treaties that we look at that 
October, that June 14th date as the beginning of what Juneteenth is, because Juneteenth is about, you know, when the news arrives or when some major event happens that celebrates that freedom. So mm-hmm. uh, we, go, we need to go to, uh, as I say, June of 1866 to talk about the first Juneteenth and, you know, celebration and so forth like that. There are all sorts of ways to do this, and no way is right or wrong. It really is about celebrating this, uh, you know, this new uh, sort of status for uh, enslaved people. And mm-hmm. uh, there's no reason why it has to be limited to one day. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Cassandra. Could, could I add something sure. to that? And Absolutely. Because, you know, Sherry said it perfectly. What I would add is that um, when we talk about independence, so say we talk about July 4th, and I'm reminded of what Frederick Douglass's July 4th mm-hmm. um uh, speech was all about that, right. you know, this was a declaration of independence for the the 13 colonies. But the 13 colonies is represented by, by the white men of those 13 colonies, that freedom and independence only applied to them. Right. It did not apply to everyone else. And in fact, if you actually read the document that Jefferson wrote and was amended by those who attended the, the uh, convention, um, it it specifically left out people of color. It specifically left out African Americans. It specifically left out this notion that 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 Jefferson had that America would stand against slavery. It specifically mm-hmm. left out those things. And so independence was not applied to everybody. So this notion somehow that you know I remember when George. H. Bush got up in 2007 and declared, you know, at the commemoration in Jamestown that since 1776 we've all been free. I almost had a stroke because (laughs) clearly the people, everybody he was talking about, had nobody who was black in that group. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there's this this misguided perception that that we keep feeding ourselves that America, since a certain time period, has actually accomplished, has met those aspirational goals when it hasn't. What Juneteenth does is it it it, it repositions America to a much more realistic viewpoint that freedom and equality is an evolving process. Mm-hmm. So and let me, that we haven't made it. Let me ask you, ladies, Absolutely. and I want to ask both of you um, to respond to this, but you know, Juneteenth came out, it didn't come out of nowhere because people have been fighting for years to try to, to make this a national holiday. But the fact, mm-hmm. the speed in which this bill was passed um, and, uh, and and the George Floyd um, Justice and Policing Act is, you know, null and void basically right now because they refuse to, d- to debate or, or to try to make, mo- make movement on it. The um, um, people, the Voting Rights Act, you know, things that, that are super meaningful to the day-to-day lives of people. Not that that having a national holiday is not important, but there's a lot of caution about saying, don't let this be the the placard. Don't let this be the the thing that, that kind of lets people, takes people's minds off of what's super important that we need to get through Congress. And I'd, I'd love to hear your reactions to that. Uh, Sherry, I'll start with you. Um uh- yeah, it's really important. What ha- what is happening now with it being a national holiday is that we have a platform by which we can stand on, and uh, I mean, just and I envision that we would have a national headquarters set up in the same kind of organizational infrastructure as the NAACP, the national headquarters, and you have Juneteenth chapters around the country. And some of those chapters are going to be activists, and some of those chapters are going to just do their annual dinner, you know, every year. But, it, you know, but it will take on the flavor of the, 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 the leaders of that uh, chapter and the history in that area. I feel mm-hmm. like the, the, what Juneteenth Virginia is focused on is that we want to explore our local history, which is our national history, because this is where the nation was born. And so well, who we are today as a nation in 2021 started here in Tidewater, Hampton Road 757. And so we have a responsibility as well as an opportunity here, because when we tell that, that history from our own perspective, we get a much different story to, story there. Mm-hmm. I mean, just to take the 16, 19 arrivals, who mo- many of them were indentured servants who worked their contracts and gained their freedom. And therefore, I like to look at them as being the ancestor to the black middle class. 
nobody but black folks going to talk about black middle class before the 18th, 19th century, you know, but we get to do that because we're interpreting our history. And so having June, I've already heard from people talking about, you know, oh, it's just going to be another holiday kind of thing like that, just to sit around and, you know, have, you know, have a party and a barbecue. Absolutely not. That's certainly that's part of it. But certainly, you know, we now have a platform by which everyone is welcome to stand on and uh, move forward. And I think that we have – this is a good thing, a great thing. And, yeah, we've been working on this for years. I mean, years and years and years. <laughs> and, again, the, for the fact that it happened so quickly after all those years is – I'm still kind of like, you know, trying to catch my breath here. <laughs> Cassandra, also the same question in terms of, of – you know, looking at the, the, the other things that are happening in Congress and, and how they're not moving compared to how this that we were able to just garner that that uh, bipartisan support. Well, you know, I think about 2019 and I think about this national attention was directed to Hampton Roads and specifically to Fort Monroe. And so there it started a national conversation. And then um, the 1619 Project coming out of the New York Times uh, really put it on a national platform. Uh, And there were lots of debates and still ongoing debates, the the usual thing of people vilifying that their point of view, even though scholars have been making their argument. They got those arguments from scholars. Mm -hmm. And and not all the wrong stuff, but, you know, the the correct things about the role of African-Americans in this nation's history and the absence, the historical silences in our larger narrative. Um, I agree uh, with Sherry talking about this region, you know, for years up until um, the 1930s, and then they picked it back up uh, right at for a short period after the Second World War, and that lasted for maybe about 10 years. There were Emancipation Day celebrations. The mm. first Emancipation Day celebration happened right here in Hampton Roads, and the largest one happened right in Norfolk, where 5,000 people participated in a parade. Wow. And what earmarks each of these celebrations, whether it's Emancipation Day or whether it's Juneteenth, is that African Americans recount their history to the people who are in attendance so Mm -hmm. that their narrative, their voices, their interpretations are the ones that people hear, not outsiders who have perhaps a different viewpoint. These first interpretations were coming from the participants, from those who were actually engaged, and they passed those stories on uh, generation after generation. But when it's interrupted when there there's no longer a an event that will record the history that will talk about that history that will put out that history for the nation um Mm -hmm. the the nation suffers and Mm -hmm. we don't get to hear that story over and over and over again for future generations this is what holidays are all about it's about perpetuating a history, hopefully a correct one, about why we're celebrating that event. And so Juneteenth should be broad in its spectrum, inclusive, and also telling this complicated story about how the war didn't suddenly end on April 9th, 1865, when right. Robert E. Lee surrendered to um, Ulysses S. Grant. Instead, the fighting continued, the resistance within the Confederacy continued until June 19th. But even then, there was still a lot of rancor, still a lot of violence. And Juneteenth was not about celebrating the violence, but it was about celebrating the perseverance and the eternal hope that African Americans had about freedom as a matter of fact the, the people got dressed up in their very finest when they were yes. were celebrating and we'll talk about some of that in just a moment 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation do you celebrate juneteenth um it has it been a tradition within your family and if it has give us a call we'd love to hear what you do and what stories you pass on to through the generations 440 440- 
1-800-940-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. We also want to hear from those of you who may be for the first time hearing about Juneteenth. What questions do you have about this um, now holiday, national holiday, <laughs> in, in just a couple of hours, uh, but definitely a state holiday here in Virginia um, as of uh, last year and um, and also celebrated in 48 states. So, Cassandra, get, set, set the stage for us. Give us a sense of what was, what was happening um, prior to General Granger actually getting into Texas um, and, and the start of, of uh, Juneteenth so that people kind of understand where, where we were as a country then. Okay, so a lot of people are focusing um, a lot of attention on the Emancipation Proclamation because the general order included what was in that Emancipation Proclamation as the reason, you know, as the authority that was being used. So the Emancipation Proclamation was by executive order. This was not coming from Congress. Uh, This was coming from the president's authority as the executive um, of the of the American government and as commander in chief of the armed services. And so he had that authority, especially in law, excuse me, in a war to to exert his authority over the territories that were in rebellion against the United States. And those were all the 11 Confederate states that has that had seceded from the nation. And so when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, it had essentially four purposes. The first purpose was to um, deprive the Confederate states of the labor of African Americans and, and men and women, um, because it was encouraging people to flee to union lines wherever they may be. The second purpose was to utilize the labor of African Americans on behalf of the federal government. And so they were paying them. Now, there are lots of issues about how much they were paying them and what they do with the money, but essentially they were still paying them. The third one was to raise a military force of African American men, especially, whether that military force was through the army or it was through the Navy. And, and, the, those who were serving in the Navy, um, they were placed aboard ships. So the Navy was not segregated, uh, but the Army was. And in fact, in Hampton Roads, uh, both in Norfolk, Portsmouth, and in Hampton, six um, regiments were raised, uh, and and that includes the first United States Cal- Colored Cavalry. Uh, those mm-hmm. units were raised right here in the Hampton Roads region. Um, and the, the fourth reason was that since England uh, got a lot of its cotton from the South, they wanted to keep England from continuing to openly support the South. Because England had uh, positioned itself by 1830 to be against slavery, they knew it would be an international embarrassment for them to be supporting uh, uh, slavery. And because it took until January 1st, 1863, for the American government to say, okay, so we're not just fighting a war to force the Confederacy to come back in the Union. Instead, this war is about ending slavery. Because the the Confederacy had already said that they were seceding because this war was about preserving slavery. And and Mm -hmm. so with that, England had to go undercover in terms of its support of the Confederacy. It continued to provide arms, munitions, ships, and so forth to the Confederacy, but they could not do it publicly. And Mm -hmm. so this impeded, to some degree, their ability to do that. So the document had a a political uh, focus, an international focus, and it had a a needs, a military needs focus. And so it had all of those things wrapped into one. There's also the other issue that uh, the, the areas like Hampton Roads was an occupied area by May of 1862 in Norfolk and in Portsmouth. In Hampton, of course, it continued to be um well, Fort Monroe never left the hands of the U.S. government, and shortly after Butler's arrival, he took over Hampton. And so that whole region was under Union control, and all the areas that were under Union control, the Emancipation Proclamation 
was not supposed to apply to them. But on the other hand, Mm. because the military in the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to, and I want to quote this, it says, the military and naval authority will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom, then what you would start to see are military commanders making rules governing the freedom of individuals in the occupied territories. And so, in essence, while they could not legally free them, by military order, they allowed them to be free and put in place certain rules of Mm. conduct as to what slave owners could not do against them. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the backstory, and that's what what Granger took with him, that authority, that perspective, that practice he took with him to Texas, because the 13th Amendment, which wouldn't take effect until December of 1865, was several months from actually enforcing the end of the slavery rule. And so in, until that point, the military was the one that had the authority to designate who could be free, who could not be forced to do labor, and of course they were tasked with protecting it. Okay, if you're just joining us... Can I make a quick point about the Emancipation Proclamation? Yep, hang on one second, Sherry, and I'll come right back to you. If you're just joining us, it's in another view history lesson with historian and dean of the College of Liberal Arts at NSU, Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander, and playwright, activist, community organizer, and founder of the Juneteenth Festival Company, Ms. Sherry Bailey. 440-2 Six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are our numbers to call. Join our conversation. What questions do you have about Juneteenth? Okay, Sherry, you wanted to add about the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm so glad to have Cassandra here today because the history, the facts are important, absolutely. And what I get to do is to take it on the stage and be able to create a, a, a you know in a fictional kind of world where the conversation can continue. Mm -hmm. And with the Emancipation Proclamation and the play that uh, we will be doing this this weekend at the festival called Abolitionist Museum, and it has eight historical figures from history. We have John Brown, Nat Turner, Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and John Brown. And uh, they're debating whether or not to burn a Confederate flag that's been placed in their uh, museum. And, um, you know, and, and at one point, David Walker, one of the characters, assails Lincoln for the Emancipation Proclamation. He says, it didn't really sound like you meant what you were trying to say. And uh, Lincoln gets booed sometimes in the show. And uh, the fellow who played Lincoln the first time around, he said, who who knew that playing Lincoln would make me the heavy? But, uh, you know... But what it does is it allows people to talk about these issues in ways that they can relate to. And so to have the history correctly presented and then Mm -hmm. to be able to have a conversation about it, it does a tremendous amount in terms of people healing and, again, understanding and being able to move forward. Absolutely. Let's go to the phone lines. Neil joins us from Hampton. Hi, Neil. You're on the air. Yeah, first I, I would like to say, man, I love your program. I've, I've listened to it, and I've learned so much. Thank but you. But the other part of it is, is that I want to just put a different perspective here. And, if, and uh, certainly white, powerful men had a massive amount of effect on slavery in the New World. But it was also white, powerful men that eliminated it, and that the Voting Rights Act and the uh, voting rights for women and most of the stuff that uh, we see with the gay rights all came from white, powerful men. And I just want to say that if we try to say that somehow that the white population is a monolith, it's like saying that the black population is a monolith, and we know that's not true. Absolutely, sir. We and and we never want to uh, portray that either of parts of our society are a monolith because they are different people and different perspectives coming from both. But I'm going to let our guests respond to you. Thanks so much for the call, Neil. Uh, Cassandra, you want to respond? Yes. Um, you know, one of the most important things is is to remember what our history books actually say. And our history books actually say that Congress, which um, in 1919, when the 19th Amendment was passed, 
that that actually was passed by that Congress. And so it was made up entirely of white men. So it does not, we're not talking about taking away from what the narrative already says about the accomplishments of whites to correct wrongs that were done. Um, what we're saying is that the story is more complicated than that. And, and this is not supposed to be a celebratory history where we only talk about the good things that we're proud of. You know, the history has to be filled with the contradictions, the complications. And that's why it's, it's very, very um, difficult uh, to talk about these things in American history because we have lined up our history with our patriotism. And history is what it is. And I, while I hate that phrase, that is actually, I guess, the, the best phrase to use with this. You know, it's just like Frederick Douglass. He was definitely not a perfect person. And I say definitely not because he had issues with his first wife. Um, he had um, he, he gave some mealy mouth explanation as to why he married a, a, a woman who was seen as white. Um, he he tried to backtrack on a few things. And so, but that doesn't erase the wonderful things, the important things that he did. It's just that we cannot make icons of any of these individuals because no one can identify with or want to hear about an icon, a person who's perfect. You want to hear about the complicated stories and of the complicated lives of people so that you not only can relate to them, but you can, all, but you can also see where they went wrong or when they, where they went right, and to make an assessment based on the facts of what happened. Okay. Sherry, did you want to add anything? You know, I often say that for the last 155 years, the folks who lost the Civil War have controlled the narrative. And uh, that is got to change. And um, once we are able to, again, be the tellers of our stories, uh, then that's going to make a big difference because it's not about pointy fingers or, you know, holding blame. Uh, it is about uh, telling the truth. As a matter of fact, Sherry, because I love on, on your website and everything else, you always talk about learning about slavery without shame and without blame. Why, why is that important to you? Because, of, you know, how are we going to get anything done if everyone is shouting and screaming and crying about, you know, their feelings being hurt and so forth like that? We cannot change this history. We cannot make it go away. So what we have to do is face it and move beyond that. And so our, our mission is to help America heal from the wounds of slavery without shame or blame. And a lot of times there's a lot of pushback on that, and, uh, but that's okay because that's part of the issue. And uh, being able to tell our story to empower people with the ability to tell their stories is, again, I think what this, and here at Hampton Road 757, we have such a fantastic opportunity because it's been pretty much untouched, except for Cassandra. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, you know, she can't do it all. She, she needs, you know, folks, you know, with her there. And uh, so we, we need to empower our population, and that is everyone. Whoever is interested to, in doing this work, they need to be welcomed and be allowed to figure out how this history works. Oh. We have set up for uh, our history, we talk about the war against slavery, which is basically from 1831 with the Nat Turner insurrection to 1877 when the federal troops were pulled from the southern camps, and that allowed the rise of KKK and Jim Crow. So the war against slavery, WAS, um, 1831 to 1877 is the block of that's the history that we are intending to share with people and to help them and have them participate and, and share and, and help that history grow. OK, and we'll talk about where they can go to see you guys and see your play in just a minute. But let's go to Charles in Suffolk. Hi, Charles. You're on the air. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I was a member of the Contraband Society uh, down here in, in Hampton. And mm -hmm. one thing about that they, you know, that. Uh, people don't even remember or don't know about is the fact of uh, when ben Benjamin Butler uh, had the three runaway slaves come to uh, Fort Monroe and their owners demanded them back and that uh, he turned around and, and confiscated them as a, as a uh, contraband of war to flee them. And uh, he told them that, you know, because he, the, uh, Southerners wanted wanted him turned over under the Fugitive Slave Law, but uh, Benjamin right. Butler was also a lawyer, 
and he told them that the uh, that the fugitive slave law only applied to American citizens, and seeing how they were no longer American citizens, it didn't apply to them. Okay. But after that. Let me, Charles. Let me, let me, let me let that because we were running out of time. Excuse me for interrupting you. Um, but let me let uh, Cassandra and Sherry continue the story, and we will talk about uh, General Butler and and that work because um, you know, as you all know, Steve Cornelison over in the Peninsula is also a huge um, proponent of telling the story of of uh, the contraband and um, and including that in the narrative of Juneteenth. Um, so, Cassandra, I'll let you take that. Well, it, it should be included in the narrative of Juneteenth, and it's kind of like what Sherry said earlier, that each area gets to tell its own story that is really about Black agency. Um, even with um, the the order that Butler gave, and I understand there's new research showing that, you know, the rationale for it came from one of his officers, which is fine. You know, that's just how military service works. (laughs) Um, But, you know, the idea of, of thinking of them as contrabands of war came from the very men who took their own freedom upon themselves and advocated for their freedom. And what they argued was that they did not want to assist. They did not want their labor to assist the Confederacy in their efforts to preserve slavery. They did not want them to pull them away from their uh, families because their families were in Hampton, and they wanted their labor to go to assisting the uh, U.S. government in fighting against those individuals who were their slaveholders, who were their um, captors mm-hmm. in so many ways. And so that agency and and the agency of African-Americans in Texas and beyond um, really is the story of Juneteenth, because a lot of people forget, or maybe they don't know, that right at the end of the fighting in each region, so when when uh, Robert E. Lee uh, surrendered and when the other uh, Confederate commanders surrendered in their various areas, that a plethora of horrific violence was 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 set upon every single African American in the community because the former Confederates were furious and they committed so many murders against African Americans and that happened in Norfolk, it happened in Hampton, it happened everywhere in the South. And so that part of the story seems to be absent as we tell this narrative of the Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War. But Juneteenth takes that history and talks about perseverance, talks about agency. It talks about how we're going to remember this history. Regardless of what the nation does, we're going to remember that history, and we're going to pass our stories to our children and their children's children's children. Sherry, tell us about some of the the early celebration. Um, what was a Juneteenth celebration like, and um, and then how did it spread from Texas? Because because really it was it started in Texas. So how did it get to the rest of the country? Well, as I said uh, earlier, it, the, the uh, June of eighteen sixty six. Uh, in Oklahoma, you had the treaty signed by five Indian tribes, and uh, many of uh, us uh, kind of uh, national Juneteenth advocates uh, see that as really the beginning of Juneteenth in terms of it being celebrated in a, a real co- conscious way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, and it also takes on the flavor of that locality, because their ah. history is the history that, you know, they are interested in sharing and talking about, and there's a lot of incredible history there. Um, and so, of course, everybody in the last uh, uh, few, few couple of weeks have been focused on what happened in Tulsa. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Tulsa was not an isolated incident in terms of that type of violence uh, mm-hmm. against folks. I mean, Oklahoma had over 100 uh, all black black towns and so forth like that, and I think they're less than like a, a half a dozen at this point that are still viable. Um, so Juneteenth is celebrated again in all the different ways that people do, you know, those kind of things. And uh, I wanted to uh, 
to touch on uh, uh, something that happened at the, the surrender of Appomattox uh, with the Lee's surrender mm-hmm. is that uh, – there were all of these black battalions of soldiers uh, that were in the vicinity, and they l- literally switched the signing date of something to the April 10th because they didn't want the black soldiers to be a part of the official painting and draw- uh, uh, of the event. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. the kind of, like, um, underground information that only, you know, folks mm-hmm. f- from Juneteenth or who have been appointed to go research that kind of stuff will find out about. But that's an important piece of history there. And, you know, to tell the story of the contraband, I mean, they probably couldn't even swim. And yet they saw that rowboat and they made them jump. They jumped into that boat and said, I want to be free. And they were willing to take that risk. And so we learn about the agency that was displayed by folks. And so uh, Juneteenth is celebrated in a variety of ways. And, um, you know, that is, I think, you know, the beauty of all of this is that we can be supportive of voting rights and, uh, you know, be active in all of those ways that we need to be to protect and grow our communities. So uh, could I yeah, go ahead, could I also ask mm-hmm. one thing really quickly, and mm-hmm. that is um, that the um, Emancipation Day celebrations, Um, And the Juneteenth celebrations kind of followed a similar pattern. And Mm -hmm. that is that, you know, you'd always open up with a prayer. You would always have a public gathering. Um, And um, and and you would all and here in in um, Virginia, the public gathering would often be in a church. So one of the local churches would host it. Uh, You would always have a parade. You would always have music. You would always, in some cases, you would have floats, you know, people wearing different costumes, representing different things. Um, You would always have the organizations, the African-American organizations participate. Um, But you would always have one person get up there and tell the history of how that community got where it is today. Then you would have somebody read, you know, in the case of the Emancipation Day celebrations, they would read the proclamation. Uh, In a lot of the Juneteenth celebrations, they would read the order that Granger read. Um, So there was a recounting of how that history happened for them. And then you would always have somebody read a poem that was relevant to the day and have someone sing or groups sing and perform. But at the end, you would have a of the main speaker who would say, where do we go from here? That would always be an important element because it wasn't just about remembering the past. The past gave you that foundation. Where are you going to go from here? What are you going to do? What are you going to accomplish? And that was characteristic of all of these celebration. Now, I was reading um, our crack producer, Lisa Godley, who always finds out the most interesting things. So um, according to uh, culinary historian and writer Michael Twitty, um, red foods traces back to the times of enslavement because many of the common, uh, more common foods of the day were white, green, or brown. And there was an excitement that came with, with the rarity of eating red colored treats. And so um, things like red velvet cake, uh, red beans and rice, um, and so forth, uh, and the barbecue. Lunch become mm-hmm. a, a mm-hmm. major staple of Juneteenth celebrations. Sherry? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 uh, thank you, Cassandra, for that, because that is the way that Juneteenth definitely gets celebrated uh, up until now. Now we've got social media, and uh, it, it is, it's a different energy because there's so many people who can participate and, uh, you know, there is a, a, a lot of sharing and, uh, you know, the, 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 the connections to the past. Like we have uh, Miss Juneteenth pageants in certain chapters around the country, you know, and, uh, you know, so and but very few of them at this point just focus on having a party. Everybody seems to have a social agenda as a part, as as a part. of what they do. So, we, Sherry, we got about five minutes left in this conversation. I want you to tell people where they can come see your plays this weekend <laughs> and what, what's we going will, on, some of the major things that are going on. Well, thank you. We will be uh, uh, on Saturday, uh, June 19th, from noon until 6 p.m. at uh, Trinity Episcopal Church in downtown Old Town, Portsmouth. And the irony of this is that uh, this church is located directly across the street from where the Confederate monument used to be in downtown Portsmouth. Literally, we look at that that, that empty space now. Uh, and what we're going to put in that space is a um, replica of the 17-foot rowboat that would have been used by the uh, Contraband Three. 
uh, someone donated that to Juneteenth, and uh, it needs to be refurbished and all of that stuff, but uh, they can at least get a look at what it is now, and hopefully we can raise a crew to do the refurbishing of that. Um, and that will be uh, a part of what we will be offering out of the festival park. At mm-hmm. 3 o'clock, we'll be doing the play that I referenced earlier called Abolitionist Museum, and uh, I really would love to have a nice crowd out there because a big part of what we do with the theater is that we present the play and then we have the conversation. In that play, they're debating whether or not to burn a Confederate flag. And so the first thing we say to the audience at the end of the play is, okay, you are a resident of this wax museum. What would your vote be, to burn or not to burn the Confederate flag? And we've performed this play in many schools, middle middle and high schools, and it's not always a slam dunk in terms of how that post-show discussion goes, <laughs> but it's always interesting and it's always, uh, you know, of relevance to what we're trying to achieve. And do you find when you're doing those community conversations very quickly that people – come walk away with a different perspective, even if you haven't changed their mind um, or, or, you know, or they didn't know. But do you do you feel like it at least opens a door to greater understanding between the races? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I won't. Uh, I'll just say that you'll have an opportunity to see a clip at the uh, festival this weekend where we were out in Suffolk and we had uh, someone shot from the audience. Uh, Nat Turner killed my family, and she was looking at the actor who was playing Nat Turner as if he were indeed Nat Turner, and then it all happened like two weeks ago. Wow. And so, also in that audience, we had Sons of the Confederacy who'd heard about the play's plot, and that was perhaps one of the best post-show conversations we could have ever hoped for because we had people coming from radically different perspectives able to have a civilized conversation. And there's a clip that we will be showing at the festival that people can see exactly what I'm talking about. Wow, that's incredible. So, and tell us your website. The website is uh, www.juneteenthva.org. Juneteenthva.org. Cassandra, I want to give you the last uh, minute or so in terms of what people should think about in terms of this weekend. I know there are a plethora of activities, um, and, and you can go to whro.org slash talk about race. We have a full list of all of the uh, activities within Hampton Roads. But I'll let you have the last word in terms of what people should think about as they celebrate this holiday. Um, I think that they should think about um, the fact that if they don't know information about it, look it up. Um Take the time to visit one of the programs, such as the one that Sherry is doing. Take the time to uh, uh, pull, go to the um, African American um, Museum of History and Culture in in Washington D.C., the National Museum, and look up their information about what they're doing and the history of Juneteenth. That is the best thing to be educated. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander, the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Historian at Norfolk State University, and Sherry Bailey, with uh, who created Juneteenth <laughs> VA in our area and has been at this for a very, very long time. Ladies, thank you so much for this history lesson today. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of the group Take Six, and you're listening to Another View. And welcome back. It's been almost 50 years since Father's Day became a nationwide holiday in the United States. But the practice of recognizing our dads for their love and influence doesn't always get the grand celebration showered on moms on Mother's Day. Well, Shayla Eggleston wants to change that. Our Lisa Godley spoke with this up-and-coming author about her new children's book, My Daddy Says. My parents are divorced, and my father was not in the home with us for the majority of my life. And I had my grandfather. (laughs) He was fantastic, and he really did step in with that role as being a father in, in those younger years. Shayla Eggleston describes her relationship with her father during her teen years this way. We had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship. It wasn't that great. But as she got older, that changed. I find myself always saying, my daddy says this, and it it could just be about life stuff. It could be about money or relationships with people or whatever the case may be, but I always am constantly 
thing my daddy says. And when she became a parent, she noticed that her daughter was doing the same thing. My little one, she constantly says, my daddy said this. And when she was younger, she she was really bad about it. Like, I, I didn't know anything. So according to her, it was really all about what her daddy said about everything. And that really tickled me. Eggleston says she held the idea of a children's book about fathers and their relationships with their children for about a decade. And when it was time to publish, she knew exactly what to title it. My Daddy Says. Here's an excerpt. My daddy is smart, and he likes to have fun playing with me and my little brother. My daddy says that I can be anything that I want to be, even Superwoman. And it's an image of them playing out in the yard and the little brother's running around with his cape on and he's holding Olivia, the main character, holding her high in the sky with her cape on. So that he tells me I can be anything I want to be, even Superwoman. Eggleston says her father and grandfather heavily influenced her life and provided positive affirmations that have shaped her very being. As a result, she felt it important to point out the significant role that fathers play in their children's lives. I hope that they learn that, you know, the father is supportive. He can be there. He can be fun. He can certainly be involved. And I want the, the little ones to just see that imagery. That's why the illustrations are so colorful and, and tied in with the words in the book. But I, I just really want children to just take away that their relationship with their father is just as important as any other relationship. And, and what he says and how he's involved is important. I really believe that the role of fathers is so critical um, in a child's life. And I really felt that we do glorify mothers and they're wonderful. I, I'm a mother, so I feel like I'm wonderful too, but I really feel like the role of a father, especially in black homes, has been really removed and kind of, I don't, for lack of better words, I want to say demoralized, but it, I don't think we see it as critical of a role in a child's life. But I felt that it was really important to show imagery of a father being present in the home and showing the impact, a positive impact that they can have on a child's life. I just wanted fathers to just be in a, a more positive light, especially black fathers, as it relates to their children. While My Daddy Says is Eggleston's first book, it won't be her last. She's currently working with her publisher to release a second book. She says this one is about her daughter's relationship with her grandmother, and she's titling it, Hey Friend. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And you can find the book, My Daddy Says. It's available online at Amazon.com. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. There are tons of Juneteenth activities throughout the Hampton Roads community. Go to whro.org slash talkaboutrace for a list of activities. Everyone is welcome. And join the fun and learn history as you go. Or if you want to share the history of Juneteenth, why not share today's show via podcast? Just go to anotherviewradio.org and download this show or any other Another View program. Next week on Another View, how bias could play a role in your next real estate transaction, be it unconscious or deliberate. Our theme music is an original composition written and performed especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Jordan Christie is our audio engineer sitting in for Todd Washburn. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Lots of Juneteenth celebrations. We'll also have folks on hand to give you your COVID vaccine. So get your shot. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Father's Day and happy anniversary, Maxie Lee, my wonderful husband. All of it's happening this weekend. <laughs> and be sure to join us again next Thursday at noon for another view.
Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at HamptonRoadsCF.org.